our fifth session of today, uh, brought to you by Smile CDR. And presenting for Smile CDR is the CEO, uh, Duncan Weatherston. Uh, so, Duncan, with that, I'll, I'll let uh, let you take the floor. Hi there, everybody. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for joining us. Today is going to be a relatively short presentation, uh, kind of describing how Smile CDR is interacting with the COVID crisis and, and what we can do to help. We'll sort of talk a bit about also about our relationship with some of the other applications and programs that we're running. So I, with that, I'm going to start a little bit of a presentation here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Um, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. Yep, looks good. So a little bit of background about who Smile CDR are. Uh, we're a company in Toronto, Ontario that has been working with um, health data for, for commercially for the last three years, but as a team, the founders and then the participants have been involved in Ontario and, and Canadian-wide health for the past 20 years. Uh, my background was that I worked with um, Ontario's EHR laboratory systems, uh, medication, the provider registry, all of the parts of the uh, population health solutions in building Ontario, that have been part of Canadian EHR for the past 20 years. Um, my founding partner, James Agnew, was the manager of development at the University Health Network in Toronto and was also similarly involved in the creation of electronic health record capabilities. Uh, but his area of expertise was primarily focused on the hospital and the interactions the hospital had with the community. And so we, we started from that background building something called Connecting GTA, which became Connecting Ontario. And while we were building it, we realized you know, there was a bit of a challenge in terms of technologies and we thought we could do a bit of a better job. Uh, so as a consequence of that, we built the Happy Fire open source and then we built the Smile CDR commercial offering on top of that. Our open source is used globally. It's downloaded 18,000 times a month and our competitors and allies alike all use our, our platform um, quite frequently as part of their solutions. Um, what we do at Smile is we have a product called Smile CDR, which is an open standards based on HL7 Fire data platform uh, geared towards large health populations and payers and any, anybody who needs to interact with, sorry, my lips right there, significant volumes of, of data. Uh, and what we do with that tool, with that platform, is either we just sell it to people, we have, you know, people basically have very competent technical teams that take our middleware and then build out great solutions over top. An example of that would be like LabCorp in the US um, and a few others who, who were just looking for a really great fire server that was able to handle product at scale. Um, or we work with people to build solutions that sit on top of our middleware product. You know, we've built an occupational health system for the government of Canada and we, we've built some stuff for UC Davis in that regard. You know, we help companies like Fresenius, and I'll talk about our clients in a bit. But the net effect is that we have a product which is used as middleware, downloaded a lot, and, and very robust. And over top of that, we provide a set of uh, support and, and development as professional services. What we're doing around what we're doing around occupational health with the government of Canada is um, pretty great, actually. The, the the team there engaged us to find a way to present occupational health systems in an interoperable fashion that would be modularly expandable to fit the needs as they went forward. And we've been working very, very closely with them. It's been a, it's been a great relationship. Um, on top of that, currently, the, the thing with, that we're focused on COVID is our open source pandemic platform that we're working with others to build. And at the heart of that, we have our uh, Happy Fire solution and we're building, we built a um, component which is responsible for self-registration and we built another component which is responsible for clinical engagement and we're looking at other ways of, of working but on top of that, we're building a community around it and so we really do believe in the value of um, participation of the community and I'll talk about that maybe a bit later. Um, on top of that we're looking at national interoperability, the ability to work with each of the health systems around Canada and the ability to create clinical value very very quickly at all levels of the healthcare stack and what we mean by that is that you know not just the ability to create value um, in user interfaces or data storage but you know we work closely with uh, data science and we provide a methodology for um, notification and, and distribution of events as they happen. So really sort of providing value in all aspects of, of the health data stream. So, so, you know, right now we're looking at a serious challenge around um, the, the 
fundamental way in which we share data. If, if you look at if you look at the way things have gone in the past, essentially data interoperability has been viewed as a messaging process. So you know, if I can wrap my data up and send it over to you, you can unbundle it and stick it into your system. We never really looked at the idea of harmonized systems. What we, we looked at was how do we harmonize the interaction between systems, and that has been problematic, of course because no two systems actually view data the same way. And so just sending messages backwards and forwards requires a lot of custom interpretation all the time and has led to kind of a bottleneck and a bit of stifling in that space. So one of the things that we really love about the FIRE approach, why it's so valuable both for COVID and for, for our clients is that the core data model is actually also backed up by a fantastic API. Which means that not only do you have a way to exchange the data backwards and forwards, we have now a methodology for exposing all of the ways you use the data at the same time. Which means that when you get the data in, you can then say, and here's how you ask questions about it in a consistent fashion. And what it means is that you can then buy applications which were designed to work across multiple systems, regardless of how you use your data internally. You've got a way for people to get at that data, exchange the data, and use the data in a consistent fashion really sort of breaking open that, that, that shell and enabling your information to become valuable um, as a sort of broadly accessible commodity that you can buy tools to make value from. And the net effect of that is you can get to market very, very quickly. Um, you can get great value from your information and you don't have to invent everything yourself all the time. And so really this, this approach is particularly well suited to our current COVID crisis, for example, because as data is stored in, a, in an open format, you're then able to get at that data in a shareable way and you can have multiple people implementing parts of this in a similar fashion without fundamentally having disagreement on the kind of information you're pushing backwards and forwards. And so really the strategy is super effective in terms of the ability to respond quickly to crises. And so it's part of what we're looking at pandemic wise as a solution space as well as how do you create a, an open approach to pandemic response? And I think that's part of the platform we're building. Some of our customers and clients um, include, you know, as all Canadian companies, you tend to go to the US and externally to get validation before you get really great traction in Canada. And so likewise with us, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association of the US, which has 100 million uh, members, is, is a client of ours and they use us fairly centrally. Blue Cross of Idaho, similarly. HCSC, which is another chain of blues with 50 million uh, members, are, are participants with us. Centene, these are all giant names and we're building at the core of their implementation the capability to handle, you know, like for example, HCSC with their 50 million members has more people than Canada has population. And so we're able to support that kind of organization or building to be able to support, you know, even bigger countries. Uh, ideally, we'd like to be able to support the entire population of India, so have a billion uh, consumers all exchanging information, and, like patients and, and practitioners and support a broad ecosystem in that sense. Um, you know, we're also involved in Canada, very closely with the government of Canada, and I'd like to call out the sort of the clever uh, approach that they took to solving this problem. And, and we think that, you know, the fire strategy that we've deployed with them is a, is a perfect partner for them. There's no vendor lock-in, you know, fire is, a, is an international standard that we're able to provide it um, effectively as a company is kind of our hallmark, but there's, Canada is not bound to Smile CDR. Um, we're able to now expose the data as a fire source and, and others can, can participate equivalently. We have a bunch of, um, partner implementations as well. We're a Red Hat partner. Uh, there's a company called Tibco in the US who are, who are well known for their data uh, interoperability uh, from the like early days and, and their, their IAG integration and their, um, sorry, HIA integration and their, uh, their participation in X12 and other standards. And so we work closely with them. TELUS is another great Canadian partner we have and we've had very good success working with them. We actually were collectively working on international clients, so they've taken us to um, partners in Australia and Mexico, and we're looking for a bright, bright future with them. And then, of course, you know the cloud partners and some of the other big players. So we're we're hooked in internationally. We're doing very well. We've got clients in Canada, the U.S., Australia, New Zealand, Europe, the U.K. Um, we're looking at Asia now, like I was saying, and South Asia. So you know, very very broad deployment. Why is, it, why is there value to clients on this? And what, what do you get if you're trying to follow this pathway? Um, what you get out of, out of engaging with this model is um, a number of things. So first of all, it's a new way of looking at data management for healthcare. And, and why say a new way? Because the, the approach that we have is there's this open standard with an open API that defines how you should interact with health data. And we facilitate that. Um, as our core DNA. Obviously we provide a platform that works across lots of standards that were not just fire, but clearly fire is something that we strongly believe in. 
to the point where we built an entire commercial platform over top of it. And what you get out of that is this transparent access to all your information, the ability to use it in ways that are meaningful as soon as necessary. So for example, um, because the, the government of Canada stood up an instance of of uh, fire implementation, it'd be very easy for them to start extending their data with COVID information that's necessary to track the, um, you know, the, the immunization perhaps of, of the staff or how we want to fit into the occupational realm. But the point is the data, the data resources and the API are there and available immediately. So extending their platform to be able to support additional data elements is trivial. It's a, it's a no brainer and it'd be something you can do quickly. You don't have to go out and try and find a new platform. Um, it gives you a single platform for data. You can build all your applications around it, but the moment you have a fire platform, regardless of whose infrastructure is hosting it, the platform tier, the, the fire tier is uh, ubiquitous and available and you can, you can model all of your interactions around it and you can, you can essentially be able to separate out your idea of data from application and be able to make your application sort of work collectively and collaboratively. Uh, it's extensible and open, so you know the fire standard is designed to be uh, easily extended, and it's constantly being renewed. The, the whole approach has this maturity model in which new ideas come in and become an, a, a, a fixed part of the standard only after broad adoption implementation. There's, there's a maturity pathway through it, and you have full control over what goes into it. So you've got all this flexibility which you never had before in these kinds of data platforms. And then lastly, there's this. Um, collaborative strategy called Smart on Fire, which enables you to build applications quickly and be able to deliver solutions uh, that are uh, compliant across the board. So again, like I was saying earlier, I don't have to invent everything yourself, but if you do invent something yourself, others can use it. And that collection really allows you to totally reduce your cost of ownership, both from a development operations and complexity standard. It's, it's a fantastic approach to things. So why is this important to COVID? How is this helping resolve problems for, for the COVID strategy? Well, um, unlike when we had the SARS crisis before, uh, we actually are, from an informatics perspective, prepared as a consequence of our fire structures. And to, to sort of evidence that, you can take a look around the place and see that you know, nationally people are sprouting up with, with solutions which work. But if you look at the fire community, we actually already have a response profiles, we have implementations, and we have the makings of a platform that will extend beyond where we are now to include clinical um, follow-up and, and the whole workflow. And so um, this, this whole approach that we have is, is, is both um, effective and, and, and current and enables you to use leverage, like enables you to leverage existing technologies that are in place to achieve new outcomes. And, and further to that, you know, our ability to support it in open source because of the open nature of, of the fire community means that the response isn't, you know, just a corporate response, it is a community response. And to that end, you know, partners of ours like Identos, um, at, uh, you know, QHR and, and TELUS have all, have all stepped up and sort of tried to collaborate and, and deliver value. It's been, it's been a really um, eye-opening experience in how you can sort of achieve things as a community if you need to quickly. Um, if you look at the, the overall um, implementation that exists in the legacy environment, it really does represent um, a, a challenge from an infrastructure perspective. So despite the fact that I'm talking about this kind of promising view from the fire perspective, one of the things which I, I realized early on in, in our discussion with the, with the clinical community is they've had to respond by upping their fax machine purchases because this, this kind of open approach to information has not been ubiquitously adopted in healthcare yet. And so there is an opportunity for us to kind of show the differential here, which is to say, you know, if you have an open standard and open approach, here's how quickly you can respond to things. If you don't, here's this legacy reaction. Here's how hard it is to do the integration. I think the, 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 the response from the existing components uh, has a very strong reflection on the, um, on, on the, on the, the reason why we need to look at these, these new technologies and the way we're going. Um, obviously, the ability to move to a predictive healthcare system um, is, is a really great outcome from, from the fire space because the information that we store in the data model is easily repurposable both for training sets and analytic sets. Uh, it becomes a great tool in, in partnership with predictive analytics and, and um, the ability to provide responsive feedback to clinical, to clinical need. It, it really is um, an awesome tool base for that. And we're in the process of, of sort of exploring how we can do that, not just within small CDR, but within the community at large. And you know, if, if more organizations had had the foresight that the federal government did, you know, what, what the team at NOAA has deployed, um, there would have been an easier response in all the other organizations to, to, the, to, the, to the issue, right? If, if they were able to just issue a fire, uh, a fire bundle in response to all the COVID discoveries they had to a central public health agency that was able to collect them and then 
uh, aggregate the information, we'd have been on top of our information game right from the start. If, the, if we'd been able to work closely with the telcos at that point, you know, using some of the newer technologies around privacy, we could have created a, a tracking application that much faster. I know the telcos have responded, and our partners at Identos, for example, have responded very quickly on that front with, 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 uh, with path tracing and, and the ability to share that information in a private fashion. Um, so I think like the, the net effect is COVID-19 has really exposed some of the challenges we have and also exposed some of the opportunities we have with the new technologies and infrastructures, which are of value. Um, so why is, why is the fire ecosystem so important? Well, look, if you look at this picture, we kind of tried to capture the idea that it captures all of the participants and it provides them with flows that work between them, right? So between the payers, the patients, and the providers. So in, in the case of Canada, that would be the government, the patients, and the providers. There are, there are both data flows and capabilities that sit in that pathway that are already in place in the, in the, in the open standard that you can then immediately activate if you're using the products that support it. And you know, to that end, um, the strategy that we're talking about really is extensible and you know is future facing because it doesn't lock you into if only I had thought about that in the past. By buying into a fire strategy, you've already thought about that in the past. You looked at what all the, all the other people in the world were doing and say, one day I might need those things. Good thing there's an open standard that's focused on that. Um, today I've got my goals, but should I should I need the assistance of the community? It's already there and it's already been thought through, and I'll just I'll just buy into it. And I think that that prescient view that was taken. By, um, by, by Health Canada is exactly why um, you know, they've got that successful model in place now. Um, why a fire data platform? Well, it provides a pandemic early warning system. Not only are you getting the data in, you're able to trend it, you're able to see the information, you're able to respond to it. And as you build out your pandemic response, you're able to share the data with epidemiology, public health, and you're able to make you know, significant value for the community around you. Um, as part of that process. And so um, I think that if you think about how you might deploy this going forward, what you could do is you would have a sort of data set that you've agreed to that was important. You'd build out solutions that are interoperable with fire. And then as you needed to, you could share information out to the fire services. Ultimately, you know, if, if you play your cards um, in a way that I think is right, you would end up with the primary data pool you have in this interoperable fire format. And then it would be up to you to evaluate applications that fit into that model and deliver value on an on-time basis. You know, one of the things that FHIR has baked into it above, I mean, there's so many things that FHIR has baked into it, consent and all these really great value systems and, and terminology, but another thing that it has baked into it of value is um, this idea of subscriptions, which gives you a way of um, actually sharing notifications as they happen, right? So for example, if you had a FHIR data model in place and you were getting information from the pandemic, you would be able to <clears throat> receive your labs and then provide notifications to interested communities automatically um, as particular values showed up in the lab system, fully aligned with the consent implementation and the terminology that was necessary for that participant model. So the net effect is you're able to create um, capabilities on the fly that leverage your existing policy framework and also meet the needs of a particular niche community with just configuration against your existing data set or with maybe a little bit of additional data should you choose to capture it. And I think that that is like the key value we're talking about for a pandemic early warning system because the next one is going to have the same problem. There isn't a test for it. Once there's a test for it, how do you distribute the test? How do you identify the symptoms early? How do you flow that data to public health? That entire stream is captured if you've got a uh, open standards approach and your open standards approach is um, around constructed uh, data and, and structured data. And I think that's the, the critical difference that FHIR brings over some of the older systems like uh, IAT, for example. Um, and lastly, the thing you can do is you can be modularized your implementation. So, you know, <clears throat> today you have a COVID model module. Tomorrow you have, you know, COVID-3 or, you know, the next SARS, whatever it happens to be. And now you create another model. You can plug in care pathways. You can plug in the lab models. You can plug in everything else and use your existing infrastructure. It gets you very, very quickly to where you want to be. Um, here's an example of, of how sort of, you know, the model would have worked with, with, the, with the fire solution for, for, for Health Canada, right? So here's a picture of a case management system. You could just extend the case management system to include, and if you look here on the side, a COVID view. Um, you're in a great position to, uh, to, to sort of easily extend, and now it's just a web application, very inexpensive to build out those resources and very rapid development against the data set that you have. And so I, I feel like I would just want to call out, you know, the PSOHP for their, for their approach on this. Um, lastly, you know, fire is becoming the lingua franca of healthcare. There, there are, of course, you know, other contenders in this market. There's open air with their AQL. 
There's, um, of course, some of the previous standards. There's you know, HL7 V3, which uh, was perhaps a bit too restrictive in its implementation. There's HL7 V2, which was perhaps not restrictive enough in its implementation. You know, FIRE is kind of like the Goldilocks one. It's just right in the middle. Um, there, there, and there are other approaches, but you know, FIRE is rapidly becoming the way that we exchange information. If you look at the US market, they've actually, with the ONC and CMS, just landed on and said, you must be fire compliant as, as a way to go forward. Um, if you look at the markets in Europe, they're headed that way. And Canada, for sure, in Ontario, is, is leading the charge with fire as well. So um, I feel like and this is, this is a real opportunity to sort of talk about how to achieve this, um, this sort of transformative step as a consequence of the adoption of the, um, I don't want to use the word new normal, we used it at the time of SARS, but as adoption of, of the new challenges we're facing with rapidly emerging uh, pandemic type issues. Anyway, that sort of wraps up the presentation and uh, opportunity for some questions now. We have uh, about just over five minutes. Are there any questions? Hernan, would you like to uh, moderate? Well, we have um, uh, 20 people, and you can um, put your uh, questions on the chat on the chat box. Oh, I think you did a good job, Duncan. There will be a recording of this, and we'll be uh, posting it later on. So if anybody missed it, uh, we can provide that. Well, all right. Thank you very much for your time, and. Uh, I appreciate that you took half hour every day. Take care, everybody.